It's been a welcome break for me lately from the usual rhythms of life. I've been in College Station, Texas, working every day in our lab here at Texas A&M. A graduate student and I have been surgically implanting neuropixels probes into the prefrontal cortex of rats and recording neurons during fear learning behaviors. This is a change of pace from parenting and housework and all the rest of the typical concerns of life at home. Life is simple and has essentially one focus, the experiment. There's something quite nice about doing the surgeries in particular. Each day I have one rat to implant. The procedure is the whole focus for a stretch of a few hours. Peering down the microscope, I clean and prepare the scalp, carefully drill tiny holes in the skull, and turn head screws into place. Gently lower the probe into the cerebrum. All else in the world disappears. I don't have bills to pay and emails to answer, places to be and people expecting me. There is only the technical task at hand. It's oddly beautiful. What I'm describing may seem strange to you if brain surgery is not your trade, but it's really no different than engaging in a craft of any kind, one which fully occupies your attention and skills, carpentry or welding or writing code or navigating a boat. There are long periods over which thoughts never turn to the clock or to the anticipation of errands. To be lost in one's work is a blessing. I warned you in the last episode that a single essay could not capture the value of Schopenhauer's philosophy to the study of consciousness. Here, I continue mining it for gold, as I move from the purely pessimistic theme to his thoughts on art and artistic genius, which I found insightful. If that previous episode left you in an unpleasant mood, then let that set the stage for what is to come. This way, you will either be pleasantly surprised by the present discussion, or you will get just what you expected. In neither case will you be too much disappointed. First, though, let's get back in the Schopenhauer mood with this passage. Quote, All willing springs from lack, from deficiency, and thus from suffering. Fulfillment brings this to an end. Yet for one wish that is fulfilled, there remain at least ten that are denied. Further, desiring lasts a long time. Demands and requests go on to infinity. Fulfillment is short and meted out sparingly, but even the final satisfaction itself is only apparent. The wish fulfilled at once makes way for a new one. The former is a known delusion, the latter a delusion not as yet known. No attained object of willing can give a satisfaction that lasts and no longer declines, but it is always like the alms thrown to a beggar, which reprieves him today so that his misery may be prolonged till tomorrow. Therefore, so long as our consciousness is filled by our will, so long as we are given up to the throng of desires with its constant hopes and fears, so long as we are the subject of willing, we never obtain lasting happiness or peace." Unquote. Evolution has indentured us into the service of individual animals. You and I are indentured to the human type, an intelligent social primate which occupies a wide variety of ecosystems on planet Earth. By mysterious means, I am in attendance to the human Jesse Winters, a Midwestern American male born in the early 1980s. Since infancy, I've been conditioned to identify this person as my very own self. If I have existed independently of this era, I know nothing of it. For all intents and purposes, I am the very same he that picks out and refers to Jesse. But being Jesse comes with a host of problems and responsibilities. Society, having made trivial the procurement of food and potable water, having obviated the ancestral conditions of hunting and gathering, rather than lessening my concerns, has made room for new and more complex ones. Someday in the future, when resources have become scarce and social order has collapsed into chaos and violence, I will look back upon these days with inconsolable envy, and yet here and now I find myself fully encumbered with my share of displeasures. It is our nature, or at least the nature of human beings, to be unsatisfied until the next thing has been achieved, and therefore never really satisfied at all, since once a thing has been gotten, another thing advances into next place, and the loop continues. But human creatures are intelligent, so we, the indentured servants, have our means of contriving to turn the tables upon our masters. 
There are things in which we delight that provide no service to anyone but ourselves. They don't move the evolutionary needle. And these are the finest things we know of music, film, and stories. It's ironic that zombie humans wouldn't be expected to sit and stare at television screens as we do. There would be no mind to amuse and entertain, so such creatures might as well get back to work. Consider the self-construct, as I have many times discussed it, the ego. In a not-too-distant episode, I related anxiety to ego attachment. Psychedelic drugs are known to disrupt this attachment, to manifest a sense of oneness with everything. Schopenhauer's term, will, is more or less the same as the self-construct. As long as we are identified with this construct, we are the subject of willing and without peace. In his book on psychedelics, How to Change Your Mind, Michael Pollan writes, quote, As mentioned, the default mode network appears to play a role in the creation of mental constructs or projections, the most important of which is the construct we call the self, or ego. This is why some neuroscientists call it the me network. If a researcher gives you a list of adjectives and asks you to consider how they apply to you, it is your default mode network that leaps into action. Nodes in the default network are thought to be responsible for autobiographical memory, the material from which we compose the story of who we are, by linking our past experiences with what happens to us and with projections of our future goals. The achievement of an individual self, a being with a unique past and a trajectory into the future, is one of the glories of human evolution, but it is not without its drawbacks and potential disorders. The price of the sense of an individual identity is a sense of separation from others, and nature. Self-reflection can lead to great intellectual and artistic achievement, but also to destructive forms of self-regard and many types of unhappiness." Unquote. Studies have shown that psychedelic drug experiences in which there is a sense of ego loss are accompanied by a reduction in default mode network activity. I remember when I was on psilocybin that I no longer identified with my usual self and modes of behavior. I didn't understand why we do so many of the things we do. I had no desire to do anything at all, not even smoke. At that time, I smoked cigarettes all the time, and it gave me a lot of pleasure to do so. But under the effects of the mushroom, I didn't want to. No, more than that, I didn't understand why I would want to. Why would I want to do anything at all? What for? I was severed from my motivational brain. As far as I'm concerned, the purpose of consciousness for the human animal is twofold. First, it is to perceive and comprehend the whole picture, the whole scene, the whole plan. The brain networks responsible for vision and hearing and memory and everything else are all in distinct locations, unaware of the others. The mind, however, witnesses them as constituting a unified experience. This would be of no use to the animal unless, and here is the second purpose for human consciousness, it is subject to motivational forces. These compel us to act on behalf rather than to be indifferent to the objectives of the organism. The self-construct or ego is, I suggest, the subject of motivation. In order for the brain to achieve this motivation, we have to identify with the self-construct to confuse ourselves with the ego, and that is what the default mode network does. Marcus Rakeley wrote an article in the Annual Review of Neuroscience, quote, the brain's default mode network consists of discrete bilateral and symmetrical cortical areas in the medial and lateral parietal, medial prefrontal, and medial and lateral temporal cortices of the human, non-human primate, cat, and rodent brains. Its discovery was an unexpected consequence of brain imaging studies first performed with positron emission tomography, in which various novel attention-demanding and non-self-referential tasks were compared with quiet repose either with eyes closed or with simple visual fixation. The default mode network consistently decreases its activity when compared with activity during these relaxed, non-task states." Unquote. I wonder if this goes both ways. In a state of quiet repose, the default mode network is diminished. In a state of diminished default mode network, one sits in quiet repose. That's certainly what I could be witness doing, riding the waves of the psilocybin experience. It isn't exactly that I couldn't do anything else. The question is, why would I? Schopenhauer writes, quote, When, however, an external cause or inward disposition suddenly raises us out of the endless stream of willing and snatches knowledge from the thraldom of the will, 
the attention is now no longer directed to the motives of the willing, but comprehends things free from their relation to the will. Thus it considers things without interest, without subjectivity, purely objectively. It is entirely given up to them in so far as they are merely representations and not motives. Then all at once the peace always sought but always escaping us on that first path of willing comes to us of its own accord and all is well with us. It is the painless state prized by Epicurus as the highest good and as the state of the gods. For that moment we are delivered from the miserable pressure of the will. We celebrate the Sabbath of the penal servitude of willing. The wheel of Ixion stands still. But this is just the state that I described above as necessary for knowledge of the idea, as pure contemplation, absorption in perception, being lost in the object, forgetting all individuality, abolishing the kind of knowledge which follows the principle of sufficient reason and comprehends only relations. It is the state where simultaneously and inseparably the perceived individual thing is raised to the idea of its species and the knowing individual to the pure subject of willless knowing, and now the two as such no longer stand in the stream of time and of all other relations. It is then all the same whether we see the setting sun from a prison or from a palace." Unquote. Schopenhauer explores the different modes of artistic expression, with the artistic genius defined as one who can capture, either in music, painting, or sculpture, a pure idea and make it demonstrable. The idea of the thing, whatever it is, is presented by the artist without regard to any actual individual instance of the thing. The idea is of a platonic nature, in some sense eternal and representative of the species of the thing depicted. Music, it could be argued, is the purest of the arts, in that the melody produces its effect directly. It is felt. Interestingly, he covers acting as well, which of course refers to stage acting since film had not yet been invented. Here's a brief passage summing up his view. Quote, to be a good actor, it is necessary for a man, one, to have a gift of being able to turn himself inside out and to show his inner nature. Two, to have sufficient imagination in order to picture fictitious circumstances and events so visit vividly that they stir his inner nature. And three, to have enough intelligence, expertise, and culture to enable him to have a proper understanding of human characters and relations." Unquote. So the genius actor can convey to us an idea of something other than himself, and do so with enough precision that we are wholly taken away by it. We forget the actor and witness the character. It is clear to me that Schopenhauer is onto something with his observations about art with respect to the will and to peace of mind. In our time, this is most evident in film and television. When you're watching a movie, there are two frames of mind which I can distinguish. First, there is the sense of being in the room, in the position of your body, in a room with a big screen upon which a piece of entertainment is presented. Secondly, there is being conscious of nothing more than the unfolding scene. You are captivated. In an important sense, you have no body and you aren't sitting in any room. Your attention is fully engaged and no attention is spared from the, for the comfort or discomfort of your body or concerns and cares about the events of your own life. Likewise, you are not implicated in the scene. It is occurring in another space and time, and you are there in that distant land with the characters. Neither are you peering through a window or sharing in the drama. It has nothing to do with you, and thus your will does not enter into it. This, too, is the way it is for reading, especially good fiction. But this latter medium is the more fascinating case because the incoming stream of data is composed of syntax on the page, yet there are moments which we fall into, in which phenomenologically we cease to be a reader with a book in our hands. There is only the scene, like a third-person dream. I hypothesize that such moments, which in a quality session of reading occur with some frequency, correlate with a stark reduction in default mode network activity. The events of the narrative are not our own, we can experience horror and distress and love and betrayal as abstract ideas, ideas in the objective sense. In this way, we transcend ourselves. It occurs to me to extend a quick point on behalf of Jordan Peterson's persistent remarks on narrative truth. The ideas presented in mythology are true and recognizable as they pertain to human nature and psychology. They are not true in the propositional sense. 
They are not facts about what happened, but they contain ideas in the artistic sense. The direction of the mind towards ideas, particularly where morality is concerned, is often the intention of our oldest stories. Thus, Peterson is referred to Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment as being a work of truth, even though it is a work of fiction. Okay, so returning to Schopenhauer, here is a passage about reflecting on one's past, which is similar to reading a story about someone else, in that the will is not implicated. He writes, quote, It is also that blessedness of willless perception which spreads so wonderful a charm over the past and the distant, and by a self-deception presents them to us in so flattering a light. For by conjuring up in our minds days long past spent in a distant place, it is only the objects recalled by our imagination, not the subject of will, that carried around its incurable sorrows with it just as much then as it does now. But these are forgotten because since then they have frequently made way for others. Now, in what is remembered, objective perception is just as effective as it would be in what is present if we allowed it to have influence over us, if free from will we surrendered ourselves to it. Hence it happens that especially when we are more than usually disturbed by some want, the sudden recollection of past and distant scenes flits across our minds like a lost paradise. The imagination recalls merely what was objective, not what was individually subjective, and we imagine that that something objective stood before us then just as pure and undisturbed by any relation to the will as its image now stands in the imagination. But the relation of objects to our will caused us just as much affliction then as it does now. We can withdraw from all suffering just as well through present as through distant objects whenever we raise ourselves to a purely objective contemplation of them and are thus able to produce the illusion that only those objects are present, not we ourselves. Then, as pure subject of knowing, delivered from the miserable self, we become entirely one with those objects, and foreign as our want is to them, it is at such moments just as foreign to us. Then the world as representation alone remains. The world as will has disappeared. Unquote. He said there, pure subject of knowing, delivered from the miserable self. That's it exactly. That expresses the two forms of self that I've been telling you about. The pure subject of knowing, what I call the self as point of view, and the miserable self, what I call the self-construct. The real self is the subject of knowing, since it has no preferences, no personality, no plans, no narrative, it has no will. Now contemplate this. If free will is an illusion, then why has evolution gone through so much trouble in the construction of a false self subject to the coercion of motivational forces? Why trouble the conscious mind with striving and hope and care and longing? Because otherwise there is no reason to get up in the morning and disturb our quiet repose. Mm -hmm.